So this is our first video recording of the recording of a True Crime Brewery podcast. This is exciting. I, I hope we don't screw it up. <laughs> not too badly. Well, I'm sure we will, but it's it's just showing um, it's like behind the scenes right. at a TCB episode. And when I think back to when we first started doing the recordings, the podcasts, we were horrible. So there's... Uh, no downside to this, right? No. Worst case scenario, I just won't put it out there. <laughs> okay. See? Yeah. So we're good. Okay. Let's do this. All right. Let's see. I have to do a double check. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Today's episode is sponsored by Simple by Simple Contacts. Get $30 off your contacts at simplecontacts.com slash TCB at checkout. That's simplecontacts.com forward slash TCB. Dr. Tariq Rafe, his wife Sultana, and their 20-year-old daughter Basma were viciously bludgeoned to death in their Bellevue, Washington home on the evening of July 12, 1994. Atif Rafe, the son of Sultana and Tariq, found them when he returned home around 2 a.m. Atif and his friend, Sebastian Burns, both 18 years old, had gone out to dinner, a movie, and they had a late night snack as well. They found this horrific scene just after 2 a.m. Sebastian Burns called 911 at 2 a.m. 2 for help. Now the two teenagers then ran into the street to wait for the police. There were reports that the police had a difficult time finding the Rafe house, which was located in an upper middle class neighborhood. A few minutes after the 911 call, a police cruiser passed the house, unable to find the correct address. The teenagers chased after it, pounding on the window to get it to stop. Upon entering the Rafe suburban Seattle house, police were shocked by the horrible, bloody crime scene that they found there. Sultana was dead from fatal blows to her head. Basma was critically injured and died later at the hospital, having suffered repeated blows to her head and her body. Dr. Rafay's body was on his bed with his head completely crushed. His bedroom was covered in blood, bone, teeth, and tissue from this brutal killing. Yeah, we saw pictures, which I wish we hadn't seen. I know, things like that you can never get rid of once Holy they're in your cow. head. Yeah, yeah, terrible. Sebastian and Atif had solid alibis, though, which the police ended up interpreting as efforts by the teens to, by the teens to avoid detection. Yeah, it sounds like the police were suspicious of them from the beginning. It really does. They were cooperative as police put them up in a motel that night and questioned them over a two to three day period, but police found their reactions to this event to be inappropriate and even a little bit suspicious. In the days, weeks, and months following the murders, the Bellevue police put together a case against them, but they discovered that the physical evidence was pointing away from supporting that either Sebastian or Atif were involved in this killing. Right, and obviously we'll discuss that. Yes. That's a big part of our discussion. It is. Nine months after the murders, frustrated by the lack of evidence of the guilt of Sebastian or Atif, the Bellevue police enlisted the assistance of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in an effort to obtain incriminating evidence against the two. Now, the RCMP decided to initiate an undercover sting operation known in Canada as Mr. Big in an effort to elicit a confession from one or both of them. Evidence from a Mr. Big operation is not admissible in the United States unless it's obtained outside the country at this time that this happened. At this point, the teens were living in Canada. So today at The Quiet End, we're discussing the vicious murders of three innocent people and a possible case of the wrongful convictions of two young men. Their confessions given under a method that is illegal in the United States and has been declared illegal in Canada now are what convinced them and what keeps these guys in prison today. 
In Unfortunate Sons, The Convictions of Atif Rafe and Sebastian Burns, we look at the Mr. Big method of obtaining confessions, the other suspects in these murders, and the trials and appeals in this case. But first, of course, let's get the beer review because I'm sitting here with an empty glass. Well, we have to do something about that. We do, we? yes. So today we're going to talk about Dragon's Tooth Oatmeal Stout, which is brewed by Elysian Brewing Company in Seattle. So it's an oatmeal stout. And these are stouts that are medium to full-bodied, sweet and smooth due to the addition of oats in the brewing process. So they're, they're pretty nice beers. <laughs> this one's 8.1% alcohol by volume, so it's up there, but it's not a real heavy hitter. That's good. But it's up there. It it's is. enough for sure. Yeah. We, we won't be, be drinking too many of these. No. So it's a near black color. I mean, a really dark, dark, dark brown. Call it black. There's a thick, fluffy tan head and some pretty lacing to it. It has a nice roasted malt and grain aroma, which translated to a chocolate and oatmeal taste with a hint of coffee. This is a heavier bodied beer. Uh, very nice to sip and savor, and a good beer. Nice, so thanks, Dick. I'll pour you some. Let's open it up. Have you got your special True Crime Brewery bottle opener with you? <laughs> of course. See? Yes, very nice. So let me open this. Okay. And pour some for you. Oh, it's dark. And some for me. Gracias. Uh -oh. oh no. Good thing I brought backups. <laughs> okay. So let's take these down to the quiet end. Okay. And start our discussion. All right, here we go. Pretty quiet at the quiet end today. It is. I mean, our, our new kind of friends on their blind date, their computer date or whatever, Yeah. aren't here tonight. No, but last week we did end up hanging out with them. You they bought them each a beer. They were pretty cool. Now she was kind of a sissy beer drinker, but that's okay. I used to be that way. She had an Allagash White. Well, I wouldn't call that a sissy beer. No? No. Well. I mean, she's not drinking big shot IPAs and stuff like you. <laughs> well, you know, but not everyone can be like she me. Was, she was still holding her own. I mean, yeah. At least she wasn't drinking Bud Light or something like that. Yes, I know. You see them there drinking the Bud Light out of the... What are those bottles that are aluminum? Is that... Are they just aluminum bottles? Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's like a can in the shape of a bottle. Yeah, I'm a real snot about those, which is stupid because there's nothing wrong with it. I think it's because well. I had those at a football game once and I was like, how many times am I going to have to walk to this concession stand to have one of these little piss-poor beers? They exactly. only let me buy one at a time, I think. Right. And the only thing you're going to do with those is pee your brains out. And I'm not a big football fan, so it wasn't really well, helping me get through it. Sounds like a fun time. 